please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Liz Roth Johnson. Hi, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and I, I think as you all know, we are in for a big treat tonight because after this lecture, we're going to get to go out into the lobby and taste and eat some of this science that we're going to be learning about tonight. Yeah, right? So that sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, and I can't really take full credit for that because I, I don't cook that well. Um, so I really do have to thank our, our coordinators, Jenny and Susan, for making this all possible. And of course, our chef, uh, Andy Schrader, for not only coming up with a menu that will be delicious to eat, but will really help illuminate these science concepts that we're going to discuss tonight. So on tonight's science menu, we have four concepts in biophysics, phase transitions, elasticity, viscosity, and diffusion. At this point, you might be wondering, why biophysics? I mean, clearly we all eat food, and regardless of how much science or biophysics we know, food tastes delicious, it nourishes us, so why should we even, why should we even care? I mean, you might even be wondering, what is biophysics? Um, and that's a valid question. Um, essentially, biophysics is the application of physics to biology, to biological systems and biological materials. And since all of the food that we eat is biological, it comes from living things, biophysics actually turns out to be quite relevant in thinking about the food that we eat. So I propose that knowing a little bit of biophysics or the science underlying your food can help you appreciate your food in a whole new way as you eat it. Um, and if you enjoy cooking, might even help you become a slightly savvier chef in the kitchen. OK, so first up, we're going to discuss the concept of phase transitions. And to do this, we're going to think about uh, one of the menu items that we'll be eating tonight, cheese fondue. Yeah. <laughs> so. We're actually going to take it, we're not going to start with the cheese. We're going to take it all the way back to the beginning and think about how milk is transformed into cheese and then how cheese is transformed into cheese fondue. And I don't know if we have any Tolkien fans in the audience. I know the third Hobbit movie is premiering tonight. Um, and, uh, and I like to think of this little schematic as there and back again. Milk's journey from a liquid to a solid back to a liquid. So to think about how this happens, we're going to use the concept of phase transitions to guide us. Um, so phase transitions are simply the change from one state of matter to another. And I would bet that at some point, if you think back to your school days, you were shown a diagram that looks something like this, where water or some other material was being changed between three different states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. If we could zoom in on the molecules in these materials, what we would see is that the state of matter depends a lot on the way that the molecules in that phase are interacting with each other. So in a solid, uh, molecules tend to interact a lot. They're packed together. They, they interact in a pretty stable way. In a liquid, um, those molecules start to spread out a little bit. They, they still interact with one another, but to a lesser extent than in a solid. Um, and then by the time you go to a gas, really those molecules don't want anything to do with each other. They're all spread out doing their own thing. Um, and so this is really key to what we'll be talking about um, this evening, uh, this idea that the state of matter um, depends a lot on the way that molecules are interacting, the extent to which molecules are interacting with each other. And so we see examples of phase transitions all the time. Um, you know, we're very familiar with this. Um, and we tend to associate phase transitions with heat in a very directional way. Um, our intuition usually tells us that if you heat things up, they go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. If you cool things down, they go back the other way. So I want you to think about that intuition. Keep that in mind as I show you this video of an egg cooking. Now what we have here is a, essentially a liquid. It's a thick, gloopy liquid. And as we add heat, this should come as no surprise, the egg cooks and it transforms into a solid. So this is kind of backwards from our intuition, right? Now we, we've taken a liquid, we've added heat, and it's not become a gas, it's become a solid. So what is it that makes it go from a liquid to a solid when you add heat? Well, the answer is proteins. Uh, proteins are a biological molecule. They're found in all kinds of, pretty much all living things. Um, and 
proteins do some funny things when you heat them. So in an uncooked egg, proteins, um, which are essentially just chains of, of molecules called amino acids, they like to fold themselves up into these very self-contained little packages. Um, and when they're in these self-contained little packages, they don't like to interact with each other terribly a lot, so they behave sort of like a liquid. But when you add heat, all of those self-contained little proteins start to unravel and unfurl. And as they do that, they begin to stick to one another. And as they stick to one another, they form this sort of cooked protein network. And if you recall from our previous slide, we know that the state of matter depends a lot on how much molecules are interacting with each other. So now that we have these proteins all stuck together, we have a more solid state of our egg. Now, proteins are in all kinds of food, and so this sort of um, weird phase behavior that we see with proteins, we can see for other types of foods in, in, that we eat. Uh, milk is no exception, and so when you make cheese, a lot of these same principles are at play. Um, so let's just consider what is in milk for a moment. Uh, milk is a, a watery solution that contains a lot of protein, about three to 4% by weight, contains some fat, some sugars. Uh, what I've drawn here, just for simplicity, is uh, just the, the large proteins and the fat that are in milk. Um, and so these sort of little pom-pom looking things are big protein structures in milk called casein micelles. Um, a casein micelle might look something like this in a cartoon, or if you want something a little more realistic, this is an electron microscope image of a casein micelle. And these are essentially just big globs of casein proteins all stuck together with some molecular glue. Um, and so transforming milk into solid cheese really depends on getting all of these protein globs, these casein micelles, to start sticking together and forming a solid network. Um, and so cheesemakers, there are different ways they can, they can make this happen. They can trigger this transformation. Often they'll use an enzyme called rennet to start this process. Um, but at home, there are other methods we can use. Um, in particular, if you want to make a homemade fresh cheese, you can use a little bit of heat and some acid to start this process going. And so here I was making a, a fresh cheese at home. I had just heated this milk and turned off the heat. I'm pouring some vinegar into my milk solution now. Um, stir it a little bit and just wait just a few minutes. It really doesn't take long at all. And what you'll see after just a few minutes is that all of those casein proteins have now started to stick together and form solid, what we call solid curds. These are the cheese curds and left behind sort of a watery whey. Yeah, so, yeah, and it doesn't look particularly appetizing at this point, um, especially that whey. So we get rid of the whey. That's, that's the kind of weird part. And we end up with fresh cheese that looks slightly more like something you would want to eat. Um, and if you could look at this under a microscope, it might look something like this, where we now see this extensive network of proteins and molecules that are giving us that solid texture. If we could zoom in even further and show this as a cartoon, we would see that these casein micelles have now arranged themselves into this network. They're all interacting with each other and giving us this solid state. So we've made it to cheese. We've turned our liquid milk into solid cheese. Now, how do we go back to liquid fondue? Well, here is a sort of classic cheese fondue recipe. This comes from the joy of cooking. Um, and there's a lot of different ingredients there, um, but really the two key ingredients I want to draw your attention to are in red, the cheese, and the wine. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, you're, you're kind of cheating a little, right? Because you're just adding a whole bunch of liquid back to your cheese, and then, yeah, it's going to turn into a liquid. And, and that's sort of part of it, but if you've ever tried adding liquid to cheese, you might know that, that that doesn't necessarily make a cheesy, wonderful, creamy fondue. You can end up with a really stringy, globby, clumpy mess. Um, so the key to getting a really nice, smooth, delicious cheese fondue that you would want to eat really has to do with heat and with acid, and the acid here comes from the wine. Um, so what happens if we look at the molecules in our cheese, if we add heat, things start jiggling around and moving around. And this, this lets your cheese melt, and depending on kind of the structure of the cheese at this point, so if you have this nice network of intact uh, casein micelles, you'll end up with something really kind of stringy, like mozzarella on a pizza. So this is where the acid comes in. If we add acid, those casein micelles, those blobs of protein stuck together, actually start to fall apart a little bit. 
And when they fall apart, the, tex the texture changes, and you get a nice kind of creamy, gloopy cheese, much more like the fondue that you would expect to eat. Um, so with a little bit of heat and acid, we can transform our solid cheese back into a liquid fondue. Um, and so that's how phase transitions help us think about uh, cheese fondue. But what good would a cheese fondue be without some bread to dip in it? Yeah. Um, so imagine eating a piece of bread or a bagel or a piece of thick crust pizza. What kinds of adjectives come to mind to describe that experience of eating a big chunk of bread? Go shout it out. Chewy. Chewy, yeah. Crunchy. Cr crunchy, yep. Great. And so you're, you're describing very textural things, right? The bread is chewy, it's crunchy, it's springy. And so understanding how bread gets that texture, um, we... Uh, it's very helpful to think about the concept of elasticity. Um, so elasticity is essentially just the squishiness or stretchiness of a material. A uh, rubber band is a great example of this. Um, it's a very elastic material. You stretch a rubber band, it resists your pulling a little bit, and when you let go, it relaxes back into its original shape. Um, and so if we zoomed in on that rubber band, what we would see is lots of molecules that behave a lot like tiny molecular springs. And so those tiny molecular springs are giving that rubber band its sort of elasticness. Um, Jello is another great example of elasticity. If you imagine kind of gently squishing a Jello cube, it again, it resists your uh, deformation just a little bit, and when you let go, it springs back to its original shape. Um, and similar to the rubber band, jello is full of molecules called gelatin that form an extensive network that also behaves much like a little molecular spring. Well, bread also has, as we sort of discussed already, these types of elastic properties. If you smash a piece of bread, chances are it's going to relax back into its original shape. It has very kind of elastic properties. And much like rubber bands and like jello, um, it gets those elastic properties from molecules that behave much like tiny springs. In this case, the molecules in bread are two proteins called gliadin and glutenin. And so what happens as you make a bread dough is that these glutenin and gliadin proteins begin to stick together and stretch out and form an extensive springy network. Um, and this network of glutenin and gliadin is known as gluten. So if you've ever wondered what exactly gluten is, you're looking at it. It's a, a network of gliadin and glutenin proteins. Now, um, these elastic gluten networks are developed when flour is mixed with water and then mechanically worked, for example, by kneading. Um, and so these microscope, electron microscope images show bread dough at various stages of development. Um, over on the left, we have a dough that has been added, water's been added, but it hasn't really been mixed a lot yet. And so you'll notice that the network is still fairly sparse. There's not a lot of, of, um, of stretchy gluten developed yet. Um, as we knead and work the dough, we see more of these long, stretchy fibers developing. And then finally, in our fully developed dough, we have a very dense network that's going to be perfect for our super chewy bread. Right? So that's great for breads, for bagels, um, for chewy pie dough. But it's not so great for other baked goods. Right? Like, who wants a tough muffin or a chewy pie crust? Right? So these are, again, a few excerpts from The Joy of Cooking. And I'll just give you a minute to read these. Right, and so based on what we know about how gluten is developed by mixing and by adding water, it actually makes quite a bit of sense then why the Joy of Cooking would recommend that you keep mixing of your muffin batter to a minimum to avoid making it tough and dense, why you want to minimize uh, handling your pie dough or limit the amount of water you're adding. 
Um, and even your choice of flour can make a big difference. Uh, different types of flour have different protein content. Uh, for example, a bread flour is going to have much more protein in it than a pastry flour. Uh, and so because gluten is made out of proteins, gliadin and glutenin, the total amount of protein that is available is going to control, to some extent, the total amount of gluten development you could possibly have. Uh, so bread dough is great for bread and chewy things that you want lots of gluten in, um, but for something like a pie crust, you might opt for um, something like a cake or pastry flour that is going to help limit the amount of gluten that can form. Um, so we've seen now how elasticity relates to bread's springy texture um, and how knowing this can actually help us maybe tune the elasticity in our own bread products that we make at home. Um, so let's now think about another sort of textural aspect of food. Let's think about viscosity in, uh, the, uh, in relation to soup. So I love soup. Soup is probably one of my favorite things to make at home. Um, just purely because it's just so versatile, um, both in its flavor, but also in its, its texture. Um, right? So you can have really thick, creamy pureed soups. Um, you can have creamy chowders. You can have thinner broths full of pretty much whatever you want. Um, but what makes one soup thick and another thin? I mean, what is uh, controlling these different textural properties of soup? And so again, to think about this, let's turn to another concept in biophysics. Let's turn to viscosity. Uh, viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow, but more colloquially, we think of this as thickness, right? How thick is a liquid? And so to think about this, let's consider first just two different fluids. Let's consider water on the left and oil on the right. So intuitively, we know that oil is thicker than water. It's more viscous than water. And that has a lot to do with how the molecules in these two fluids interact with each other. Um, so let's consider water first. As water flows, all of these little water molecules are sort of transiently interacting with each other and then dissociating. They interact, they dissociate, they interact, they dissociate. Um, and you can almost think of them as like tiny pieces of Velcro. Um, so as they come into content, they, they bind together and then they release. They stick, they release. Um, and so the water molecules are pretty quick to stick and release and so they flow very rapidly. Oil molecules, on the other hand, um, you could think of as much bigger, longer pieces of Velcro. So when they flow, when they come into contact with one another, they are going to stick and stick and stick a little bit longer and then release, and stick and stick and stick and then release. And so the sort of bulk effect of all of that sticking is that the whole bulk uh, amount of oil is going to flow a lot more slowly than the water. We can also tune the viscosity of liquids by adding things to them. Um, we can add all kinds of different stuff to water, for example, to change how it flows. Um, so just a few examples are um, small molecules like sugar um, can decrease the way that uh, water flows. Um, consider honey, for example. Honey is essentially a super concentrated solution of sugar. And all of those sugar molecules like to stick to water and um, keep it from flowing. Um, food particles can also increase viscosity. They act sort of like big boulders that impede the movements and flow of water. Um, and starch, that's probably the most, um, the, the most familiar. Starch is commonly used as a thickening agent. Um, starch molecules are made up of long strands of sugar molecules. And those long uh, polymer strands um, get tangled up. They're very snake-like, almost like spaghetti noodles. And they get tangled up and restrict the amount of movement that water, uh, water has. So stuff, adding stuff, can change your viscosity. Um, but it's not just about the types of stuff. It's also about how much stuff you have. Um, so consider, for example, the process of making a reduction sauce. Um, when you start a reduction, you start with a fairly thin liquid, uh, let's say balsamic vinegar, and you cook it down on the stove. And as you cook down that balsamic vinegar, water evaporates and it becomes more and more concentrated. And as it becomes more and more concentrated, it also becomes more and more viscous. Um, so at the end of that process, you hopefully have ended up with a nice syrupy, thick balsamic reduction. So let's think about this in the context of soup. Um, here is a, a carrot miso soup that I like to make. It's from Smitten Kitchen. It, 
I love it because it's really thick and creamy and it just makes me feel good to eat, especially when it's cold out. And, um, and it's kind of funny that I say that it's creamy because if you look at the ingredients list, there's no cream, there's no dairy. So why, why do I associate creaminess and thickness with this soup? Well, really, it's because you're pureeing it. So by pureeing any kind of fruit or vegetable soup like this, you're breaking down all of those carrots or other vegetables into small particles. And so we know that particles can increase viscosity. Um, you're also incorporating bubbles of air, tiny bubbles of air, which, much like food particles, can also increase viscosity by impeding the flow of water. Um, and fruits and vegetables um, are also just naturally full of starches. So when you blend them and break them down, they're also going to release just a little bit of starch into your soup to help thicken things up just a little bit more. So that's great if you want a blended soup, um, but we don't always want to puree all of our soups. Um, so there are other ways that you can thicken things up. Um, probably the, the most commonly used way to thicken soups is by using starch, um, usually in the form of cornstarch or flour. Uh, and so I already mentioned that starch molecules are long chains of sugar molecules. Um, they're big, kind of snake-like noodley molecules. Um, but when they start out, when you start with some dry cornstarch or some dry flour, all of those starch molecules are packaged up into these tiny globs called starch granules. Um, and so this is an electron uh, microscope image of what those starch granules look like. And so the first step in using starch to thicken your soup is to add water and hydrate it. When you hydrate your starch, the starch granules start to swell, and all of those noodley starch molecules uh, start to wiggle around a little bit more, maybe peek out of the starch granules. Um, and at this point, we know this can sort of thicken things up. You know, if you make a slurry of cornstarch in cold water, it gets thick, but then it kind of settles out and separates. Um, so the magic really happens when you add heat. When you add heat to this, all of those starch molecules start to escape from the starch granule, and they interact and form this starch gel. Um, so again, here's another electron microscope image of what this looks like. Um, and so this gel of starch has some super thickening power. I mean, if you've ever added cornstarch to a soup or a sauce, I mean, you know a little bit goes a long way. It really doesn't take a lot to thicken things up. Um, and so a great example of this is, is a roux. Uh, roux is commonly used to thicken gravies and sauces. Um, a roux is essentially just a combination of flour and fat. Um, in this case, I use butter. And by mixing those together, we hydrate and heat our starch and our flour and end up with a roux that has a nice thick consistency similar to a, a thin peanut butter. Uh, so one last thing to consider is that viscosity changes with temperature. Um, and I sort of learned this the hard way. Uh, the first time that I cooked Thanksgiving dinner on my own, I made gravy for the first time. And I was really proud of myself. I made my roux. I used the turkey drippings. It was tasting really good. I had it on the stove. But the texture just wasn't right. It seemed too thin. I just It wasn't what I wanted. And so I grabbed the cornstarch, and I started doctoring it. And, and I, got it, I got it right where I wanted it to be on the stove. And so I, I shut off the heat. I poured it in a nice gravy boat, put it on the table. And I think some of you know where this is going. <laughs> About 15 minutes later, when we pass it around to pour on our gravy, it didn't really pour anymore, right? It was sort of like the consistency of a, of a jello. Um, so it was, I learned the hard way that viscosity increases as temperature decreases. And just to see that firsthand, this is our roux from before. Um, and this is roux, let's see, is it playing? Yes, okay, so this has been just removed from the heat. It's still very hot. If I drag the spoon through it, it flows back together very quickly. If we wait 10, 15 minutes, just like I did with my gravy, we'll see that things have changed a bit. So again, I drag the spoon through. Right, so, so this is really important to keep in mind as you're making a soup or a sauce that you know the consistency on the stove when it's hot needs to be just a little bit thinner than the final consistency that you want it to be, and, and this is why. <laughs>
Great, okay, so we've now seen how phase transitions create a delightful cheese fondue, how elasticity helps explain the chewiness and springiness of bread, um, and how molecules can tune the viscosity of soup. Um, so now we're ready for our fourth, our main course. Um, and for our main course, as you'll see tonight, um, Chef Strader has made a really uh, delightful shrimp cake with hollandaise sauce. I'm very excited to go try it. Um, and it's a very complex dish. And I like this dish because it's a nice reminder that even though right now I'm sort of dissecting um, all of these different foods and using them just to isolate one concept in biophysics, really these concepts come up all the time all together in the foods that we eat. Um, so just to recap a little bit, we can think about the shrimp in our shrimp cakes um, in terms of phase transitions and in elasticity. As we cook a shrimp, the proteins in the shrimp are going to start to unfold and stick to one another and make the shrimp a little bit more firm, a little bit more solid, which also relates to elasticity, right? Because you start with a really squishy raw shrimp, you cook it, it gets firmer, and if you overcook it, it gets really rubbery, right? So elasticity is also changing as you're cooking that shrimp. Um, similarly, the hollandaise sauce um, is a nice lesson in viscosity as well, um, because that hollandaise sauce is full of tiny fat droplets, full of proteins, and all of those particles in that sauce are helping give it a nice, thick consistency. But to consider our fourth, um, our fourth science concept for the evening, diffusion, I'd like to just focus on one very small part of this dish, which is the pickled vegetable relish. So both diffusion and pickling are all about molecular movements. Um, in pickling, you need to exchange water in the vegetable with all of the delicious pickling liquid you've submerged it in. And so diffusion is simply the movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. Um, and we experience this also uh, quite often, in, especially in the kitchen. Um, for example, if you are cooking something on the stove, you know that as it cooks, that delightful aroma of what you're cooking will start to creep out of the pot and fill your home. And this happens spontaneously. You don't need to sit there with a fan and make this happen. Those molecules are just going to move. They're going to move from the pot to the rest of your house. Um, and so to really think about how molecules are diffusing and how this process happens, I think it's first really important to realize and appreciate um, that molecules are always, always moving. So this um, is a movie of the fat globules in milk, so all of these little brown blobs are fat globules, and they're jiggling around in the milk. They're always moving. And even though you can't see it, all the water molecules are also moving. And all of these molecules are jiggling around, they're bombarding each other, and as they jostle and move, all of these molecules tend to spread out, um, as we know intuitively from our uh, aroma example. Um, but in 1855, Adolf Fick, a physician, actually derived a mathematical equation um, to explain what happens as molecules diffuse. Um, and I know this is known as Fick's first law of diffusion, and I know it, it probably looks a little bit intimidating, um, but really the, the message it's conveying is quite straightforward. Essentially what it says is that the movement of molecules is driven by a concentration difference. Um, so let's think about that in terms of pickling. Here we have a cucumber, and we submerge it in our pickling liquid. And at this point, all of our pickling molecules are at a very high concentration outside of the cucumber and a very low concentration inside of the cucumber. And so what Fick's Law tells us is that those pickling molecules are going to want to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. Um, Fick's Law will also tell us that the bigger this difference in concentration is, the more pickling molecules we have outside of the cucumber, the faster this process will happen. One other kind of neat thing about this is that, that water molecules, we tend to forget about water molecules because water's everywhere and we can't see them, um, but water molecules also diffuse, they're moving. Um, and so in this case, water molecules tend to come out of the cucumber and into the pickling solution. Um, that's hard to see, so instead let's look at what happens when you salt mushrooms. Um, so in a second I'll play a time lapse, and all I've done is sprinkled lots of salt on top of these mushrooms, and we'll see what happens. Right, so that transformation happens because we've added salt to the outside of the mushrooms, which has made the water concentration inside the molecules much higher than outside, uh, the water concentration inside the mushrooms, much higher than outside of the mushrooms. And so again, Fick's Law will tell us that those molecules will diffuse from inside the mushrooms to the outside. <laughs> 
Okay, so we've seen now how the concentration difference affects uh, the movement of molecules. Um, but what about this mysterious D in this equation that I've been ignoring? Well, this D is known as the diffusion coefficient. Um, and from the equation of Fick's law, um, we know that the larger D is, the more quickly molecules will diffuse. Um, so D is kind of an interesting term because it bundles together a whole bunch of properties. Um, it bundles together temperature, the size of the molecule that's diffusing, um, and the viscosity of its surrounding environment. Um, and so we know that, again, a larger D means faster diffusion. Um, so we can then say something about how all of these different factors affect diffusion. Uh, we can say, for instance, that things will diffuse faster when the temperature is higher. Uh, we can say that a smaller molecule will diff diffuse faster than a larger molecule. Um, and we can say that uh, a molecule will diffuse more quickly in a low viscosity environment than a high viscosity environment. Well, size of molecule and viscosity might be a little bit tricky to play around with in the kitchen, uh, but temperature is something that we can manipulate quite easily. And so again, here are two quick pickle recipes. Uh, the one on the left, once again, is from The Joy of Cooking. Um, and for their quick pickle recipe, they recommend um, pouring pickling liquid on your cucumbers and then refrigerating for 12 hours. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty quick. Um, well, another quick pickle recipe, this one from Rachel Ray, um, simply says to leave it out at room temperature and let it cool, which can take maybe a few hours. Um, and so by adjusting the temperature, we can make diffusion happen more quickly at room temperature than in the fridge um, and have our quick pickles even quicker. Okay, so that brings us uh, to the end of tonight's science menu. Um, we've seen how phase transitions, elasticity, viscosity, and diffusion come to play in tonight's meal. Um, so now I, I'd just like to circle back to my original question. Why biophysics? I mean, I hope by now that I've convinced you that understanding a little bit of biophysics um, can reveal a whole new side of the food that you're eating. And I hope you'll keep all of this in mind as you enjoy your meal in a, in a few minutes. Um, but I also have another proposal for you. I think that the same biophysics concepts that explain the properties of our food can really help us understand the molecules, cells, and tissues in our own bodies and really help us understand ourselves and our health and how disease happens. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few very quick examples of, of what I mean by this. Um, so for example, we saw that phase transitions and the way that proteins stick together drive the process of cheese making. Well, a quite similar phenomenon is actually um, the basis of several types of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so on the left, these fibers that you see are fibers of a protein called amyloid beta. Normally, amyloid beta does not form these fibers, but when it does, that's um, typically associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, similarly, there are several types of uh, what are called prion diseases, where proteins that shouldn't normally stick together start sticking together, um, and they form these large deposits. So all of these brown spots are big deposits of proteins in a brain. Um, they should not be there. Um, and so. By understanding how proteins come together and undergo these types of phase transitions, um, this can really help scientists understand um, not only what's happening in these diseases, but hopefully develop new therapies to deal with it when it does happen. Um, so elasticity also can uh, give us a lot of insight into disease. Um, it turns out that the elasticity or, or squishiness of cells uh, can change dramatically in a diseased versus healthy cell. Uh, so, for example, malignant cancer cells are much squishier in general than healthy cells. Um, and so this video shows a cute little cartoon of a technology that Amy Roat is helping develop, um, or her lab is developing at UCLA, um, in the hopes of essentially measuring the squishiness of cells as a way to diagnose cancer. Yeah. Um, viscosity also comes into play in our bodies. Um, blood is probably the most obvious example of this. Um, it's, it's water, but it's full of stuff. Uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and all of that stuff increases the viscosity of your blood. Um, when 
the amount of stuff changes or other things change, like your red blood cell count changes, your viscosity, the viscosity of your blood changes. Um, and that can lead to changes in blood pressure, to changes in circulation. And so again, understanding that the viscosity and the flow and the properties of blood um, can help scientists um, develop drugs that thicken or thin blood or you know, design um, proper prosthetic devices like um, prosthetic arteries that can deal with this viscous nature of blood. Uh, and so finally, diffusion. Um, Fick's law of diffusion not only helps us understand pickling, but it can help us understand the gas exchange that occurs in our lungs every time we breathe. Um, if you zoom in on a piece of your lung, you would see that the lung interfaces with your capillaries. And relative to each other, there is a high concentration of oxygen in the lung and a lower concentration of oxygen in the capillary low concentration of carbon dioxide in the lung and a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the capillary. And so again, from Fick's law, we know that these gases will diffuse along their concentration gradients. So every time you breathe, oxygen diffuses into your capillary, into your bloodstream, and carbon dioxide diffuses out. And again, when a respiratory ailment or a circulatory disease changes things, for example, by not clearing out oxygen fast enough, you can change this concentration difference and change the rate at which these molecules diffuse, um, often detrimentally. So why biophysics? Well, learning about the molecules and biophysical properties of food um, not only makes us better cooks, but I think it can really help us understand the properties of all biological materials, really of life itself. Um, so keep that in mind as you enjoy tonight's meal, and bon appetit.